Anyone that walks into my studio is gonna see the robot and the oil paintings that I did and then the paintings that Dulcinea and my robot did, but they're gonna see all these computers and all these displays and wanna know what's this all about. We have the little outside computer, and then we have the three computers that are part of this whole fusioneering process. The big guy that creates the art, the little guy that acts like a keyboard and display, and then we have the computer in the cabinet that runs the robot work cell. Early on, I was on a chairlift with a friend in Vail, and I was telling him I was concerned about viruses uh, destroying my work and getting on my computer. And he said in his business, they have two computers, an outside computer that's connected to the internet and the world and where they run all their apps, you know, where the email goes and where Word goes and spreadsheets and those kinds of things. Down the corner, I have this little tower that's my external computer. And then I have a toggle switch that switches this keyboard and this display system to this beast here, which I custom made myself, which is a lot more powerful. And this would be a high-end gamer's dream kind of a machine. I needed this computer to create the artwork that I then feed to the robot to paint. From the very beginning of this journey of fusing art and science and creating a robot that creates paintings, I made a rule for myself, in addition to not retouching a painting, that I was going to create only original work, not copy a photograph or a JPEG. Because of that, it's been a lot more fascinating for me and more interesting because I love the whole creative process. The question was, well, what are you going to paint? The first two paintings I did were using a type of AI called generative. So it's a generative system. And every time you hit the run button, you're going to get a different image. And then from those first two paintings, I migrated and kept getting more ambitious with my ideas and going into various directions. Like for instance, I have a painting with a thousand tadpoles using swarming technology, which is another subset of AI technology. And then I got into complex adaptive systems and artificial life forms and genetic programming. I got into all kinds of different areas. When I'd finish one painting, I'd go in a totally new direction because it was most interesting for me, most exciting. And I always wanted to create original work because I thrive on that whole creative process and struggling through problems to reach the next level of creativity for the next kind of painting. I got more and more ambitious. I was always setting the bar higher to challenge myself. I'm creating the painting, the composition, the design, the colors, the brushwork, all of that is created here. And then that is distilled down into brushstroke information. And then I send the brushstroke information over to the computer that runs the robot and it takes each package of information per brush stroke and it executes that and it creates the painting that way. This little guy here is kind of an interesting story in that it really just is a display and a keyboard for the computer in the cabinet here that runs the entire robot work cell. In the industrial robot world, if this is sitting on a Detroit automotive factory floor, you don't have a terminal or a keyboard and screen or PC next to it. These are run remotely, and so that's why you have the screen and the keyboard here. However, this is also used to program to write the code that goes into this fourth machine, this fourth computer. People ask me if what I see on the computer screen is the same as what I see on the wall, and they're actually not that related because I give this computer a lot of freedom to experiment within a range of parameters. And then the robot, again, has some of its own freedom, some of their own autonomy to then create. And then I always get surprises, sometimes good, sometimes not so good, but I'll always get surprises. 
I'm giving things freedom of interpretation of my original idea, and there's some magic in that because I come back in the morning and I see what it did. I go, oh, that's terrible. Let's start all over again. Or I come back and say, oh, I like it. Now when I come in in the morning, I don't dare look at the canvas. I put my lunch in the refrigerator, make some coffee and stuff. You only get one first impression. And so I stand with my back to the canvas and then I turn around and look at it. That moment always makes me nervous and I never really know what to expect. But there's magic in that that's inherent in the creative process.